All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Comstock Video Seminar. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, every session at the Comstock Video Seminar is special, but this one is maybe extra special. It's a rump session. We're going to have eight speakers uh, who will each um, talk to us for five minutes about their research. So that should be interesting, also from a logistic point of view, and I'm sure from a content point of view. I'm looking very much forward to it. Um, as there are always a couple of people who maybe haven't seen this before, let me a little bit explain how we're going to run this. So um, you may have a question at some point to a couple of the speakers, I'm sure you will. Uh, the best way of asking your question, if you can think of it quickly, while they're still talking is to type it into the chat. So there is uh, somewhere at the bottom, there is the, the chat button. You click on it, uh, the chat window opens and you can type in your question. We prefer it if you prefix your question with the word question all uppercase. I'll show you an example like this. Uh, then it's easier to see in the chat um, what's happening uh, and because people might also type other things in there. Some people sometimes they type in answers to questions or um, you know, just general expressions of appreciation or something like this. So uh, if you do it like this, we'll find it more easily. The speaker will find it more easily. Um, if you're not fast enough uh, to think of the question and type it in before they finish talking, we can also have questions um, through the microphone at the end of the talk. So if you want to ask a question that way, you have to raise your hand. And um, if you haven't seen this before, it works as follows. You click on participants. So that's uh, somewhere down there, you will see it says participants, you click on it. And then you will find over here, pops up a window with where you see the first five or six names of people participating in this meeting. And at the bottom of that, you see some icons. And the first one should be, uh, for those of you who are not speakers, I think the speakers, some of them at least will not see this, uh, a blue hand. And if you press that uh, blue hand, you are raising your hand. So could some of you, maybe even all of you, try that for a moment? And then I think you will also see other people's blue raised hands there in that little window. And then I'll pick one of you, uh, maybe somebody who hasn't asked so many questions before, right? that's how we are supposed to do it. Uh, and then they will ask their question. Um, the person who asked the most questions, uh, he's not gonna be there today. I just met him on the corridor. He has to do other things. Okay. Um, then you lower your hands again now so that we later can distinguish the actual raised hands from the, from the practice version. And I think we can get started. So my list says that Alan is first. So Alan, could you uh, start sharing your screen? So our first speaker is Alan Tsang. He is going first because he just started his new job and he's gonna be teaching an hour from now or something like this. So that's why he's first. And he will be talking about uh, learning solution concept from voting behavior. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm very happy to be presenting this work. This is going to be viewing um, some voting data from the Israeli Knesset uh, through the lens of game theory. So let's see, there we go. Um, so I think we all know about coalition formation games. Coalition formation games have players. We're trying to partition those players into groups. Each player um, has some preference about which group, which groups should form. You can think about these players as being wanting to form into teams with their friends and avoiding certain other people that they don't really enjoy the company of. Then we have hedonic games. Hedonic games focus on preferences where each player cares only about the people who they are actually grouped with. So you only care about who your teammates are and not what other hypothetical teams would be formed. So we think, I think that we all believe that hedonic games are an interesting and believable model as being a part of the Comstock community. They have compelling properties, uh, but unfortunately data for this kind of game is really hard to find and that in practice, they're kind of rarely applied in real world settings with the notable exception of matching problems, which is whole, it's a it's whole thing. Right? That's where this paper comes in. We have data from the Israeli Knesset. Um, as, uh, at the time of writing, it was from the 20th Knesset uh, where we have voting patterns for all the members of the Israeli parliament. Uh, we have data on 
uh, 147 politicians and over 7,000 bills over the course of their term. Now, this was at the time of writing, and it makes it, currently we're on the 23rd Knesset, which makes it sound like we wrote this in like, I don't know, 2015 or something, and then we've been sitting on this, but it turns out it's just Israeli politics at work. So what does the data look like? We have data that looks like this table at the bottom. We have bills that were introduced to the, to the parliament and the parliament members, some subset of them would, vote it, would have voted on this bill. Um, and naturally, the way we wanna think about this is that people who vote similarly are going to be friends with each other. Because again, if we're using this analogy as team formation, well, you wanna be in a team where other people will support your endeavors. So people who vote in a similar way, we could think of them as being friends. And people who vote differently, well, we'll think of them as enemies. And this gives us a framework to put together a hedonic games model. Um, normally, I would go into like the details of what that framework looks like. But the basic idea is that you want to, you would prefer to be in teams where you're supported by your friends and prefer to be in teams with as few enemies as possible. Right. So what does that look like? Well, we have a probabilistically, um, we have a probabilistic model, we have a pack model, um, probably approximately correct model, uh, where we spit out these coalitions that are probably approximately correct. Um, on the left, we have some ground states. We have some ground truth of what the what the actual teams are like because we have their party affiliations. In particular, we have the governmental coalition, which is in sort of warmer tones, and we have the opposition parties, which are in cooler tones. And our model results are on the right. We have this sort of Sankey flow diagram. Um, we can see that it approximately splits um, the governmental coalition from the opposition parties, which is good. We see that the parties themselves don't come out very clearly, and we believe that is reflective of the data. And more interestingly, we're able to pick out certain colorful individuals from Israeli politics who are known to sort of vote in ways that are not consistent with their parties. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with Israeli politics, I think you might have a good chuckle at this. Um, we've also compared this to machine learning algorithms. So you might think, oh, this looks like a machine learning problem because we're trying to find similar roles of attributes um, and cluster them together. So of course we threw some clustering algorithms at it. For example, this is the result from k-means. Um, for the most part, it's pretty good too, right? You could kind of separate out the government from the opposition, but we get these uh, mixed coalitions that form, which, are, which, which we think to be implausible. Um, so we think that our algorithm has, has some significant uh, advantages over uh, machine learning algorithms. And I believe that is uh, my time. So our, our paper is the first to bridge this sort of data theory gap for our hedonic coalition games. And you can try our demo. All of our results are available on that website. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So please uh, unmute yourself for a round of applause. And then do we have any questions for Alan? So indeed, nobody was fast enough to type anything into the chat, but I hope uh, somebody will be willing to either type something in now or raise their hand. Davide. Just a quick question. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, it seems that from the data, it's common in Israeli parliament to vote uh, not according to party discipline, say. You know, if you compare that with the UK Parliament, where there is strong whip, normally MPs would uh, would vote in line with uh, with what the party uh, tells them to do. Uh, but that not, doesn't seem to uh, occur there. So there seems to be more freedom for the MPs uh, to to vote according to their views. Is that correct? To some degree. So there is an organ of the government <laughs> coalition where they or enforce voting protocols. Clearly some people have not abided by those rules. Um, and one of the things that makes this data set interesting is that there's a lot of people who aren't present at all the votes because of the way that the Israeli parliament is uh, structured. Thanks. All right, thank you. Are there more questions? Going to wait a few more seconds. Um, just to yes. to, add to what Alan said to uh, David's point, the the 
Israeli politics is undergoing a setting. It used to be very freewheeling and unwhipped, and it is undergoing a process of being more and more whipped. Interesting processes are happening in parties which are using the sort of voting against the coalition in order to signal things. So there are parties who are breaking up, and we, sh we, we actually see that breakup in the data. Where, where a party has broken up and we see the different MP, the different class of members diverging. Uh, and actually the, the algorithms are showing that divergence pretty neatly. All right, thank you very much. Then uh, Anael, could you share your slides? And full screen and don't forget to unmute yourself. So our next speaker is uh, Anael Wilszynski. She's going to speak about picking sequences and she just returned to Paris. It was good before, now it's again, not slightly less nice. And you are muted. So if you're talking to me, I don't hear it. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so hi everybody. So today I'm going to present a work with uh, Laurent Gourvet and Julien Lesca, and it's about uh, some criteria in uh, fair division. So we are in a setting of resource allocation with indivisible goods. So we have a set of N agents and M indivisible goods like house, uh, cars, and things like that. And the agents have additive utilities. Um, in the literature, there are some several fairness criteria. So, for instance, competitive equilibrium with equal incomes and the freeness, uh, min max fair share, proportionality, or maximum fair share. And according to Bouvray and uh, Lemaitre, uh, there exists a scale of fairness like this under additive utilities, where CEI is the strongest requirement and MMS is the weakest requirement. But nevertheless, an, an allocation satisfying MMS does not always exist, according to a work uh, from Prokacha and other co-authors. And here we will focus on the idea behind MMS and MFS. So in MMS, the utility of each agent should be at least as good as the best utility obtained in a cut and choose protocol where the agent is choosing last. In MFS, the idea is reversed. That is, we want the worst utility where the agent is choosing first. The idea is that we have a kind of max min, mix max, min max uh, concept uh, associated with a kind of reasonable protocol here, cut and choose. So we want to follow the same idea, but on another allocation protocol, which is not cut and choose, but picking sequences. Uh, in picking sequences, we are given a policy that is a sequence of agents, which is of size of the number of objects. And uh, every, every agent is picking the best available object at her turn. Here we say the best because we avoid the strategic behaviors because the picking sequences are just here, not as an allocation process, but for giving us a measure of conflictuality of preferences. So for instance, we could have a sequence like Alice, 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 and Bob, and then we'll have the allocation, Alice first, then picks the, the car, and then the painting, and then Bob uh, can just take the diamond. Okay, we can observe that this kind of sequence is not really fair in the way that Alice is choosing three times, and even uh, before Bob who is choosing only once. So we will focus on a particular type of policy, which are recursively balanced policies where the sequence is dividing it to rounds where every agent is present uh, exactly once in each round. So now we are ready to define our new criteria. So the idea is to uh, follow this idea of max min, min max, but based on picking sequences. So we have the PSN max uh, criterion, which says that every agent should get a utility of at least the best utility obtained in a picking sequence with an RB policy, where the agent is choosing always last in each round. And we have the reverse with PS1 min, which is the worst uh, utility where she is choosing first every time. 
And we complete also with the other combinations of worst and best and last and first to have a more complete picture. And we can highlight the criterion PS and mean, for instance, which is the worst utility where the agent is choosing last every time. So it's a very pessimistic view in one way. So let's illustrate that quickly. So if we have this instance and we want to calculate the minimal requirements for Alice, then uh, if we want to calculate for PSN where she's choosing last, so we would have this type of uh, policy where Alice is choosing last every time, but the choice is between Bob and Carlos every time. So PSN max, for instance, it would be a minimal requirement of 17. Um, so because Bob is choosing before Carlos, for PES and mean we would have a minimal requirement of 13. But what we can observe is that here we've taken into account the preferences of the other agents, which may not always be realistic. So we have also other criteria which says, uh, which will give the worst case where the other agents also have the same preference ranking as Alice. So for instance, she could not get the TV and the house. So it would be a minimal requirement of 12. Just to give a quite a big picture of the criteria, they can be related like that. So where PSN apps is the weakest requirement and PS1 max the strongest. And here we have guarantee of existence and they can be related like this with the original scale of fairness of Bouvray and Lemaitre. And yeah, just to talk about efficiency, uh, it tends to select quite efficient allocation, uh, experimentally at least. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's unmute ourselves and clap. Very nice. And then do we have any questions? Again, you can, you can just type in, I have a question or you can type in the question. Very good. So Ronald, uh, I think Anel, you can just read out the question for us and then decide how to interpret it and answer it. Yeah, Ronald. So yeah, I was quite uh, quick in the presentation, but yeah, when I say best worst, is that you have um, freedom for ordering before uh, the position of the last agent, and it's where you will have the best utility according to all these different ordering in the sequence, or the best or worst. That's why. And then um, there's a question from Rida. Do you have any axiomatic correct is it? Are, um, actually, it's, it was more about um, existence of allocation satisfying the different criteria and connection with uh, the, the, the known uh, fairness criteria from the literature. And what we could say is that uh, at least what we have with implications, we have only one way, but clearly we have examples every, every time to say that uh, for instance, with the envy freeness, we have examples where our criteria are not implied by uh, envy freeness and reversal. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, is there a question? Somebody's talking in the background accidentally, I think. I think you can just okay. uh, react to Harris's comment. And then yeah. if there's a final quick question. Yeah, Harris is completely right. So the PS apps, PSN apps, uh, so the weakest in the PS uh, criteria scale, is the same uh, as the round robin share concept by Konitzer and his co-author. But uh, for them, it was in the context of public uh, share, uh, public fair division. And for us, it's for private, but it's exactly the same. Yeah, the, this weakest criteria. Let's try a very quick answer to Nisak, and that will be the last one. Okay, actually, I don't know whether I, I understand well the, the, the question of Nizak, but at least regarding ap approximation. Um, so in the whole picture, we have that MMS is Im implying, so PES and apps, which is the same criterion as Konitzer uh, et al. But uh, we have also an, an approximation guarantee of one over N, which doesn't seem, uh, 
wonderful like this, but at least it's the same as on the freeness up to, up to one root. So we have this guarantee of one over N for approximation of MMS. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Then, uh, Afi, could you share your screen? Yes, so. All right. So our next speaker is uh, Afi Micha from the University of Toronto, and she will speak about connections between matching and fair division. Go ahead. All right, thank you very much for having me. So this is joint work through the framework and Isaac's help. It's about how to set the matching meets a fair division. And let me one more time to introduce the classic resource allocation problem in which we have a set of agents and a set of the indivisible goods. And the agents have preferences over the indivisible goods. And our task here is to assign uh, the goods among the agents in a fair way. And one of the most famous uh, notion of fairness in this context is envy freeness, which requires that no agent envies the location of another agent. However, because envy freeness is not always achievable, it is excessively used a different um, definition, which is envy freeness of one good, which means that any pairwise envy can be eliminated by removing only one good uh, of the allocation of the envy agent. So while this uh, model is quite general, in this work we consider some scenarios which uh, cannot be captured by this general model. And um, let's see the following example, which has been studied before, but under the classic model, where we have a set of students and a set of courses, and each course has a capacity which is uh, equal to the available seats that each course have, uh, has for the, for the students. And as usual, the students uh, have preferences over the courses, and we try to find an allocation which is fair with respect to the students. And so, for example, you can see that this allocation of the students to the courses is then free with respect to the students. However, behind this course, there is a teacher. And so another way to see this allocation is that uh, we assign students to the teachers. And so here we can see a matching from the students to the teachers. And it is very reasonable here to assume that also the teachers have preferences over the students. So another way to think that is that not only the agents have preferences over the goods, but the goods also have preferences um, over the agents. So now we can see that the previous allocation, which was and be free with respect to the students, is not fair with respect to the teachers. It's not fair because you can see that, for example, teacher three and this teacher one for more than uh, one students. As no, it's not it's not and be free up to one uh, matching with respect to them. So by using the classic model, we can find the matching which is fair with respect to the students, or we can find the matching which is fair with respect to the teachers. But in this work, uh, we are looking for matchings that are, that are fair with respect to both sides. So we're looking for allocation of the students to the teachers or to, to the students in a fair way with respect to both sides. So a little more formal, in this work we, we are looking for fairness in many to many matchings in which there are NL agents on the left with degree constraint equal to BL and NR agents on the right with degree constraint equal to DR. So in the previous example, the degree constraint with respect to the students is the maximum number of uh, the courses that each student can take. And uh, the degree constraint with respect to the um, teachers is the capacity of, uh, of their class. And uh, under this model, uh, in this work, we are looking for matchings that are envy free up to one matching with respect to both sides. Uh, so we're looking for double envy freeness up to one matching. And um, we saw that uh, when agents on both sides have identical preferences, then a diff one matching always exists. So, uh, and to do that, we use uh, a in a very careful way, the classic uh, round robin algorithm. So in this case, it really matters in which order the agents of one side um, pick their best uh, available agent from the other side. So it is a variation of the classic round robin algorithm. And uh, on the other side, we saw that as long as uh, the preferences are not identical, uh, even in one side, uh, then a DF1 matching does not always exist. And to be a little more precise, uh, we saw this negative result uh, for, the, for a strengthening of DF1 and uh, specifically for stochastic dominance when we have access to the rankings of, uh, of the agents, but I don't want to go into, into detail at uh, this point for this. 
So here we consider a more general a different model, which uh, in a very elegant way combines two-sided matching in which edges in both sides have preferences over the edges on the other side. Uh, with fair division, and uh, we use notion of fairness that derive uh, from fair division. And now, under this model, there are many different equations. Uh, for example, uh, two-sided versions of different notion of fairness, uh, or how we can uh, how we can extend this model in the case that the edges do not necessarily have the same degree constraint on the same side. So, for example, in this equation here is how we define every freeness when one agent can have up to two matchings, why another can have up to 100 matchings. And let me stop here. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. So you heard it, she's happy to answer any questions. So let's have some of those questions. There is one in the chat. It's, I think it's useful if you read out the question and then answer it. Okay, so the question is, is there is a relationship with gate sharply per way stability? So this is a very nice question. Uh, it is very interesting to see this project when we're talking about, if we see this under the two-sided uh, maths in perspective and to talk about stability. But in this work, we don't have any connection with this. We just use notion of fairness that derived from fair division. Uh, but of course, I believe that under many to many matching uh, framework, it really makes sense to talk about stability and how we can achieve this. Then the next one is more of a comment than a question, but maybe one you want to react to. Uh, in the meantime, the next person can think of their question, raise their hand or type it in. So there is another question. If every student likes a start teacher's course, do other professors have any justification to every which students they get? Um, I think that, okay, probably we care about what students prefer, but on the other hand, we can imagine that any teacher is selfish and he really wants to have the best student in her class. So I think it makes sense to assume that also the students have preference over the students and they want to have the best students in their class. Any final question, anyone? Yes. Uh, do competitive equilibria exist in this model? I uh, have not thought of that. I think this is a very nice uh, question for recent right action. In general, I think this is a new model in which someone can uh, ask very different things and very just equations. All right. Thank you very much. Then, Ali, you can share your screen and our next speaker is uh, Ali Oskes uh, from Vienna he's going to speak about polarization in uh, networks and we can see your slides now again it's less good now again it's very good and we don't hear you in case you are somewhere there talking okay. Yes. Uh, all right. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to talk about a recent paper um, with uh, Kenan Huramovic from IMT Luca, who is also in the audience, um, which is on polarization in networks identification alienation framework. So the problem uh, we are addressing in this paper is how to measure polarization. And obviously, the question is very highly uh, context dependent. You can think of politics, public opinion, uh, economic redistribution, ethnic conflicts, etc. And the uh, empirical uh, uh, literature uh, rely on categorical data coming from either surveys, observational data, administrative data, etc. On the other hand, the scan theoretical literature restricts uh, the uh, dom domains. Uh, and mostly this is uh, done so that the domains should be unidimensional scholars or uh, at most bidimensional scholars. And thus the applications of these uh, uh, measures in the theoretical literature uh, to the empirical works require uh, extra dimensionality reduction uh, works. Uh, you could think of principal component analyses, um, uh, factor analyses, etc. And in, in this paper, we propose 
uh, to unify uh, all these uh, different uh, applications in a way uh, by the usage of network formalism uh, for the measurement of polarization. And also we provide an axiomatic characterization within what is called the identification alienation framework, uh, which I will explain uh, soon. Uh, so the setting uh, we are talking about is uh, the, set the setup of weighted, undirected, and connected networks. And when I say weighted, I mean basically uh, both the nodes and edges uh, could be weighted to see how this works. Uh, take the context of elite polarization. Here we have eight uh, representatives in a parliament who are voting on three different bills. Given this uh, basic uh, data, you could create a network of representatives in which you put uh, edges in between representatives, depending on how many uh, different issues they're agreeing on. Or you could also create a network of votes where nodes now are um, uh, vote combinations. And in each node, there are, uh, uh, you have the weight as the number of uh, representatives with that vote combinations. And for the context of mass polarization, you could think of, of uh, preference profiles uh, in the Aerobian framework. Uh, for instance, here we have this preference profile of 11 individuals and three alternatives, and you can create the network of preferences using the Kemeny distance, which basically takes the uh, pairwise differences between uh, orders. And what is polarization? We base our work on uh, Esteban and Ray's 1994 paper in which they uh, uh, take polarization as the aggregate uh, effective antagonism in a society, which is uh, a function uh, of two things. First, um, a function of uh, the identification uh, each individual feels about uh, her own group and also the alienation uh, each individual feel about uh, all other groups. Okay? And basically uh, the function of the general functional form is basically an aggregation of these functions and, and the uh, assumptions on, on this functional form is very basic, nothing further than just the summation of these things and these functions are just not even monotonic uh, for A. Okay, and here are, uh, is our major characterization result, a polarization measure uh, as such which is an aggregation of effective antagonism, uh, satisfies axioms one to three and the standard homotopicity property if it is basically this summation, which takes the geodesic distance and uh, takes the uh, square of uh, uh, individual eyes uh, uh, density or uh, the group's size. And the axioms look like as these three here. Um, uh, the first one, for instance, says that uh, if the two small uh, groups join at a point uh, that is not uh, closer than their average distance to the uh, larger group, the polarization should increase. The second axiom goes uh, a middle group uh, goes closer to the smaller group, uh, then polarization should increase. And the third axiom basically they, says that if you dissolve uh, one group into two equidistant groups, the polarization uh, should increase. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to present the longer version of this paper in 27th of October in the other uh, online social choice seminar if you're interested. Thanks. Thank you very much. Round of applause, everyone. And then please uh, get your questions ready. So what you currently see in the chat, Ali, this is still follow up from the previous uh, talk. So, Bill, are you typing in a question or is this a... No, <laughs> I messed up. Um, I'll ask something then. Uh, yeah, I will not be able to do that every time, but this time uh, I'll do it. So uh, for, the, um, for these axioms that you kind of in a nice way represented there in a, in a graphical way, I was wondering whether it also matters how many uh, of these clusters are there already. So if they are already, my, my intuition is if there are already several big clusters, then I would say creating a new big cluster, if anything, makes it less polarized in some sense. So is this somehow, um, does this matter? 
uh, right, so the actives are constructed in the way they appeared on the slide, that is that we assume that there's only these three nodes or th th those two oh. nodes. So yeah, they apply only to, to those cases. So, and so that means it's, that's enough to characterize it, just to characterize it on this uh, very special situation, okay. Right, right. And I received the question from so, uh, Alan Sang, who's asking if the paper is available online. It is just available online on my website or SSRN or archive. Yeah. So that was a private question. We didn't see it, but good that you revealed it. Um, anybody else? Final chance? Again, if you want to, you can just raise your hand in the participant panel. That's faster than typing something. Okay, then thank you very much uh, once more. Then let me explain to everyone uh, how the break works. So now in a, in a moment, uh, Dominic will create randomly some breakout rooms for us. So then something will pop up on your screen and invite you to click and go to breakout, ro breakout room K. And I think that's a pretty good one. You can safely um, press yes. And then you, it will flicker on your screen and 10 seconds later, you show up in a smaller room where there will be just a handful of us uh, around about that. And then you can have a chat with them while you're having your coffee, for example. And then you'll get a message after 10 minutes and uh, please come back. And if you don't, uh, after 11 minutes, it will just force you to come back and then we'll start. And then I see you all here again uh, very soon. So let's... All right then, everyone, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the break. Uh, we have four more talks um, ahead of us. Uh, so I would like to ask Farhad to please uh, share his screen. So our next speaker is uh, Farhad Mosin from RPI and he's going to speak about preference learning and aggregation from natural language. Um, uh, can you hear try me? To make it full screen, I think it will look yeah. mm -hmm. better. Does it work now? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Mm. All right, then I'll start. Uh, hi, uh, welcome to the presentation uh, on preference learning and aggregation from natural language. I'm Farhad. I'm working with Lirong at French Robotic Institute. Uh, most of the co authors have actually left RPI by now, although I brought RPI Lay and who are starting their grad studies at Duke and Purdue, Jibbing's now in Microsoft, and Roy's now at the Data Institute of Fundamental Research. So uh, yeah, so I mean we all. I mean, preference elicitation is of course a major part of the group decision making process. Uh, and in elections, say traditional paper ballots were used. Uh, modern electronic polling systems like uh, the Opera tool by our group uh, gives you many different options to give your preferences in terms of rankings and sliders and other things. But we thought that there's merit in the question of how we can learn agent preferences from a even more natural resource. So uh, we were thinking that how can we learn agent preferences from natural language to make a group decision? Uh, an example could be this uh, random discussion about, from a forum about good college options for a new high school student, uh, just a new high school grad. So uh, here's our sort of proposed framework for it, uh, if we can call it a framework. Uh, first, we say that uh, from texts and discussion, we want to extract opinion features using established NLP techniques. So there's the thing, we are not really doing a, new NLP stuff ourselves here. Uh, first, we're using uh, entity-wise sentiments using very common uh, sentiment analysis APIs from Google or IBM, but it seems that just sentiment, positive or sentiment, sentiment scores are not good enough uh, indicators for preferences by themselves. So we also do uh, stance detection where we run algorithms to get more opinion features about uh, whether a comment is for or against a particular alternative or not. Uh, making use of this opinion features, we then go into regular random utility models. We choose the black loose model with features as our preference model uh, based on whatever opinion features we had from before and whatever other information we have about the setup in general. And we see that the black loose model with feature itself uh, works rather well compared to purely NLP based approach, like even uh, what vectors plus neural network based approach in at least predicting the preferences in sentences themselves. Uh, and finally, we run voting uh, rule, uh, voting algorithms based on whatever preferences we have from there. 
and the aggregation result we accuracy I show here is basically an accuracy on the final predicted aggregated uh, group decision based on a discussion and we see that uh, we have somewhere around a 67 percent accuracy which is not that great for two or three alternatives but uh, it's at least uh, again uh, better than what we had with really simple vanilla uh, machine learning based algorithms so uh, the theoretical contributions we had in this work were more in the preference aggregation bit. So uh, whenever we have this setting like we have now, we have n alternatives, n agents, and everyone is sort of represented by a distribution. For our case, the distribution is concisely presented with a black loose model, but everyone is represented by distribution. Uh, the natural thing to see would be uh, probabilistic votes in this case, that uh, we treat everyone's uh, preferences as probabilistic cases and the output can be a distribution over winners or we would get a uh, probability of winning for all of the alternatives. Uh, this very natural thing can even be computed exactly using say a dynamic programming algorithm given all of the initial preference distributions, but it turns out to be very computationally uh, expensive. Uh, so on the other hand, we consider this simple thing that we are calling fractional voting, but this thing has appeared in previous literature in other works. It's basically the idea is kind of like this. Assume that uh, there's a probability of one third that agent one uh, votes for A and the probability of two thirds that agent one votes for B. Uh, we are just assuming that it's one third faction votes for A and two thirds faction votes for B. Uh, assuming this sort of fractional voting, we say that a given plaque uh, parameters, it's computationally possible to, uh, in poly time, calculate the voting rule winner for many different voting rules. And uh, we're just not saying that if we're doing it because it's easy. We actually also found this a really interesting property for the fractional vote winner that uh, under many circumstances, particularly for a moderately high margin of victory, we say that the fractional winner has a very high probability of being the probabilistic winner as well. So we don't have to go to all that computation. We can just come with the fractional winner and with high probability, we can say that, yeah, this guy is a good option for in the probabilistic sense as well. So in summarize, to summarize, this was basically our uh, framework and we, we're still going on in this direction, I would say, uh, with the high level goal of doing better AI for group decision making. Uh, we're working on gathering more data uh, as one of the problems we had was that we didn't find a data set when we initially started working out. So we created our own data set and we're continuously expanding on that. We are uh, working on uh, building on this initial framework. Uh, obviously, better models and algorithms can come in the future and definitely expand in terms of multimodal preferential learning where we use more than text in terms of speech or gesture or other things as well. So yeah, that's more or less the end of the talk. Thank you. And those very are much. Let's unmute ourselves and a round of applause. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Um, So let me start. Uh, no, let me not start. There was going to be a much better question in in the in the chat there. So, Bill, do you want to ask yourself? Uh, okay, I, I, let me just answer the. Yeah. I think the what does it mean accuracy is for me as well, right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, in our uh, the experimental data set that we created, what we went ahead and did was we added uh, annotated annotations of preferences on comments ourselves. So uh, we, uh, for a, any discussion, uh, the original annotations give us a ground truth of preferences. And based on that preferences, we can compute a ground truth polarity winner. And then uh, after the trading and everything based on whatever predictions we have, we can have an output based on aggregating this black loose models for the same discussion. So we have this predicted plurality winner uh, based on the fractional profiles and we have the ground truth plurality winner based on whatever annotations we had or the labels we had uh, from our manu manual annotations. So the accuracy for the plurality is basically uh, just comparing our prediction to the plurality aggregation of the annotations. Uh, does that answer your question? I think we'll assume that yes. Uh, okay. Then there was a so, question by yeah, Bill. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, if if uh, the next question was if individuals knew that their informal conversations were being used as inputs for group decision making, would this incentivize to them to chat? Strategically, uh, 
I would believe this would. Uh, we don't have like uh, actual pre uh, proof for that right now, but uh, I can give a simple anecdote to say why I'm saying that it probably would. Uh, we actually set up uh, future experiments based on in our groups that we would use this sort of techniques to do group decision making from discussions. And when we are doing that ourselves, we understood that we are very conscious that uh, we would make use of sentences that explicitly uh, express preferences. This that was a very unnatural way of talking. And maybe it's very much possible that if they knew that their language was being used as inputs, they would be more conscious in how they uh, express their sentences. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think that the answer would be yes. I think it would incentivize them to test strategically. Uh, and there was a comment and there's also a question. Uh, the comment was, I have worked on what linguists call models like want, must with the relation with social choice. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, I will definitely hit you up, maybe. And the last question is, uh, is fractional voting with black clothes more difficult than with Thurston Mosteller? Uh, I believe it's probably even easier because for black clues, uh, the fractional preferences themselves are much more easier to compute given the model parameters. So it, there's, I find no reason for it to be difficult than Thurston Mosteller. All right, thank you very much then. Uh... Ulrike, you can share your screen. So our next speaker is uh, Ulrike Schmidt-Krepelin from Berlin, and she will talk, I think, about something to do with liquid democracy and more complicated works uh, appearing in the title. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so today I would like to draw uh, your attention to, to a paper which uh, we recently published with several co-authors at IPCO, which is a conference on combinatorial optimization. So why do I think that this might be interesting for you? Uh, well, as you already said, uh, the motivation for our paper was actually, is actually a specific model of liquid democracy. Um, so it has a motivation from computational social choice. Um, so what is liquid democracy in a nutshell? Well, imagine that, that you have some underlying uh, question and you have a set of voters and ideally you would like to um, let all of the voters decide on this question. So all of them should, should say something about this question. But then, well, usually what happens in practice is that not, not everyone feels like an expert for every question or people are maybe lazy. So some people will abstain because of that. Um, so liquid democracy now tries to avoid the situation by letting people decide on either answering the question at hand directly or delegating their vote to some other voter they trust. And in this simple model, you just have the decision between answering the question and giving your vote to, 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 one, other, um, to one other voter. Well, in this simple uh, model, there's one inherent uh, issue which has been stressed out many times in the literature, and that is the, the issue of delegation cycles. So if you look at this picture here and you ignore the dashed arcs for a moment, then uh, those voters here are in a delegation cycle, which means that their, their um, voting power is somehow like uh, captured in, in their cycle. And in order to avoid this, uh, several authors have proposed to let voters not only state one possible delegate, but a whole set of delegates together with a uh, preference relation among them. So you could think of giving like a strict ranking. So for example, you could say, well, ideally I would delegate my voter to voter A, but if that's not possible, I would also be willing to, to delegate it to voter B. Okay, but if like from a, from a design perspective, if, um, if we're now, confronted with such an information, so with such a graph, it is not so clear anymore how we should distribute the, the voting power of the, of the agents in the network. And so we were interested in mechanisms which for every voter select exactly one of their approved delegates and doing so in a way that we avoid cycles. And if we think about this in, in more graph theoretical terms, and that brings me to the, to the second frame of my, uh, of my slide here, um, then this is nothing else than a branching. So if you're giving a directed graph and we have those preferences over outgoing arcs, then a branching is simply a subset of the edges such that every node has out to be at most one and, uh, we don't have any, and we don't have any cycles. Okay, but like we don't want to select any branching here. We want to select a branching which somehow reflects the preferences of the voters in a good way. And 
So we could ask, what is a good branching? And um, for us, the answer was, well, let's select a Condorcet winner. So what is that in the setting here? Well, first of all, we define a pairwise comparison between two branching. So we say that branching B1 is uh, at least as good as branching B2. If in the earlier, the number of nodes that are strictly in favor of B1 is at least as large as the number of nodes that are strictly in favor of B2. And then a popular branching, or in other words, a Condorcet winning branching, is one which is at least as good as any other branching. And now, well, you could ask, does there always exist such a branching? Because Condorcet winners do not always exist. And the answer is, well, unfortunately, they don't always exist. Uh, so this, if you thinking about it a few minutes, you will detect that this graph here does not have a popular branching. So this brings us to the main problem that we studied in this paper, and that was um, to decide, given such a problem instance, can we decide in polynomial time whether it admits a popular branching or not? And the answer is yes. So we, we give a polynomial time algorithm. And I would like to spend my last minute on just giving you a very high level idea about how this algorithm works. So a very naive idea would be to directly try and construct this branching. But unfortunately, this didn't work out. So we did a little de detour and first characterized popular branchings in terms of dual certificates by employing MLP duality. Um, so this gives us a statement like a branching is popular if and only if we can find those funny green bubbles here. Um, and now we can construct the algorithm in the following way. So this algorithm first searches for those dual certificates and then only later tries to find a branching which fits to this dual certificate. Okay, that's it from my side and I'm very curious for, for your questions. Um, yeah, if you're interested, you can find the paper and also a longer version of this talk uh, online. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Again, you can either raise your hand or you can type something into the chat. Let me, yeah, okay, Davide, or is that the old hand from before? No, I think it's a new one. David, you're muted. Thanks, Ulla. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, Ulrike. Uh, very interesting. So it, just a quick question. So, okay, popular branching, you said, may not exist. Okay, and I couldn't uh, parse the graph and understand it, uh, but uh, um, I, I guess I, uh, I can see why. But um, so what, what if, what if they, they don't exist? Does this approach uh, through, uh, what, what can we learn from this approach in order to deal with situations where popular branchings don't exist? And therefore, how could you, what are informed or good ways to, to determine uh, the delegation graphs? Um, yes, yeah, so there's one other approach, or I think a very natural approach, and that is to find uh, something like a, uh, I think we call it like least unpopular or like a branching which uh, minimizes the unpopularity margin, which means that if you subtract those two values from like um, the nodes that are in favor of, of the one branching and, and, and the nodes that are in favor of the other branching, you want to minimize this value. Um, and we can also um, adjust our algorithm just a little bit. It still makes use of those dual certificates. And then we can also find those uh, least unpopular branchings in, in uh, Foley time. Yeah, so I, I guess this would be one uh, very natural thing to do. Yeah. Thanks. There's a question in the chat at the bottom from Rida. Um, what if you can delegate to more than one person? Yeah, well, I guess that this is another model. So you mean something like fractional delegations that you can like uh, split your vote to several persons? Um, is that what you mean? Of course, you, you can look at this. Um, yeah then I think uh, the, the problem becomes a, a bit different, definitely. He's nodding, so I think it was a good one. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah we also considered mixed uh, popular branchings, which is would be this case. Yeah, then you have a probability distribution over them. Any final question, anyone? No. Okay. Thank you very much once more. Then uh, June, can you uh, start sharing your screen? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, June Lu.
from the University of Edinburgh, and she's going to speak about privacy in voting. Go ahead. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yun Lu. Uh, welcome to the talk, uh, How Private Are Commonly Used Voting Rules. And this is joint work with Al Lu, Liron Shah, and Vasily Sikas. And it was presented uh, at UAI this year. So it probably needs no convincing to believe that voting data privacy is a big deal. Um, in the news, we have seen examples of how politicians have exploited the huge amount of information that data mining companies have on every voter. But the question is, can we quantify the privacy leakage? Uh, for example, how much privacy is leaked by this map of how people voted in the United States. So in this talk, we're uh, curious about two things. So first, um, can releasing election results break privacy? And second, um, does the voting rule we use matter? To answer these questions, uh, we need a definition of privacy. Uh, so in 2006, Dork invented the so-called differential privacy or uh, DP. And it has since become the gold standard of privacy and it's used by big tech companies and even the US government. So can we answer our titular question with DP? Well, unfortunately, not really. And the issue is that uh, DP can only be used to, set, uh, to study randomized voting rules. So in fact, uh, deterministic voting rules cannot satisfy DP at all. Uh, so this is true for all previous works um, in this area. They all considered DP with respect to randomized. But the problem is um, commonly used voting rules are usually deterministic. Um, so can you imagine if the next president were decided on the flip of a coin? So in this work, we study deterministic voting rules as they are used in real life using the so-called uh, distributional differential privacy or DDP. And uh, the distributional part refers to the fact that we consider bad guys that have some kind of uncertainty or a distribution uh, on the, uh, the votes. So using this distributional differential privacy, uh, we can answer our two main questions. So first, can releasing election results break privacy? And the answer is actually not too much. So what do we mean by that? So we show that actually uh, there is acceptable privacy even if we output the exact histogram of votes. So acceptable being information leakage um, as defined by DDP of one over square of N where N is the number of votes. So our second question was, does the voting rule we use matter? And the answer is yes. Uh, well, perhaps unsurprisingly, but perhaps surprisingly, um, there is an actually an asymptotic difference in privacy for different voting rules. Uh, so this asymptotic difference is between one over square of n, which if you remember, it was the uh, case if we uh, output all the histogram of votes and between that and exponentially small in the number of votes. And in very, very high level intuitively, this difference depends on how easily this voting rule produces ties, so ties in the winner. So thank you for watching and um, references. Uh, so any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, let's clap. Then do we have any questions? I saw some blue hand flickering up, but then it went away again. Okay.
Okay, I'll give you a moment to think about it. Um, so can you, uh, I did not really understand your definition of privacy. So you, so you said that the DP is not really suitable if you don't have a randomized voting rule. So in simple terms, what is the main feature of your definition now? What, what does privacy mean? Yeah, so in DP, uh, privacy holds if uh, the output distribution of your, for example, voting rule on some data set uh, the output distribution if you change one person's vote in that data set. So the reason why um, deterministic voting rules cannot satisfy this definition is because, so your data set is a like a constant thing, right? It's not random. And in addition, your uh, voting rule is also deterministic. So you can imagine that the probabilities are going to just be zero or one. So the difference between these two things are just going to be zero or one. So it's not helpful to describe things in terms of DP. But uh, in distributional DP, you actually consider the data set as being having some kind of distribution. And that's why you can now uh, consider uh, deterministic voting groups. So the, last, the, the last two questions in the chat, they are for you. You can oh, answer right. both of them, maybe. Uh, so the question, uh, first one was, are the ties for figuring out pivotal vo voters? But yeah, that's very good. Yeah, so exactly. Uh, and that, that is exactly the idea. So um, essentially, uh, as we said, uh, uh, DP uh, holds if one person changing his vote doesn't change the output distribution too much. So if the probability of, of ties or the, fact, the probability that one person changing his vote is going to change the output, then it is very high. The ties is very high. Then um, the probability, like then, then the uh, privacy is also is very bad. Uh, so the second question was, what specific rule among the ones you consider is the most least private? Um, so. Uh, so we did a more concrete analysis. Uh, uh, like we ran it through some very like smaller, like 50 votes data set. And um, so we, we discovered that uh, unsurprisingly, maybe that plurality was like the most private because, you know, it doesn't consider the other uh, preferences other than the top. So yeah, that's the uh, most private. And out of the ones we uh, we're looking at, I think Borda was the least private. Uh, so can we measure noise in different ballot forms in a way that makes the results comparable? Measure noise? Hmm, I'm not sure if I understand this one. If we're concerned about um, sensitivity to noise, introducing some, some uncertainty, then um, when we're doing approval voting as opposed to uh, a ranking, uh, we have to have some way of measuring the amount of uncertainty. And it's not clear to me that you can make that measurement in ways for one ballot form that allows you to say whether the noise was greater or less than some other way of measuring noise for another ballot form. That's the question. Uh, so maybe this answers your uh, question. So uh, the way we prove uh, privacy is that we say for all distributions or all uncertainties that are of this form. So uh, privacy holds. Uh, so um, we don't necessarily have to know for sure what the, the actual noise, like how much noise there is in the ballot forms per se, but um, as long as the actual like real, real, you know, ballot form noise is within the ones we approve for, then it should be okay. Uh, Very quick answer to the last yeah. one by Michael. All right, all right. So did you consider a relation of your privacy definition to non-coercibility? Uh, so I'm not too sure what non-coercibility is, but uh, I think we have discussed uh, this with respect to strategy proofness. And in fact, some person have, uh, have already uh, did a previous work where they compared or they uh, discussed uh, differential privacy with respect to strategy or epsilon strategy proofness. So perhaps that is slightly. I think this is about whether you can, by finding out how people voted, you can uh, 
you can force them to vote how you want them to vote, these kind of things, because they can prove to you that they did what you asked them to do. Yeah, actually, yes. Yeah. So differential privacy then does like uh, make it so that people can have deniability of what they actually uh, voted. So yes, then, yeah. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Then uh, Jacques, could you bring up your slides? So final speaker for the day is uh, Jacques Barra from Warwick and he's going to speak about gerrymandering, I think. Um, influence gap voting and communities. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, great. So uh, hi everyone, I'm Jack. Uh, so I'm here to present uh, this talk, which is a joint work with Omar Lev of the Ben Gurion and Paolo Trini, also here at Warwick. Um, so the, to set the scene a little bit, um, last year there was a nature paper by Stuart and his co-authors, which used a graph theoretic metric, this influence gap, um, to predict the outcomes of elections on social networks. So this, the setting is uh, you have two party elections or two party voting dynamics in which agents are placed on a social network and they can deliberate on their preferences and then they vote. So this is a finite time voting game. Um, and what they found was that if they measured this influence gap, this, this metric prior to any of the dynamics, and then uh, compared that to the final outcome of this election. So basically, you know, say count the number of red voters at, by the end, which is this vote skew, then they find a very strong positive correlation between the two. Um, however, they use very constrained graph structures, namely small regular graphs and large scale free graphs. So we wish to show in our work the, pre uh, the effects of community and homophily. So this notion of echo chambers. So in order to define our, uh, to define the influence gap, we first need to understand influence assortment, uh, which is essentially just a centrality measure of the nodes, which rank nodes based on how influential they are in terms of essentially the fraction of their neighborhoods that they see, which votes for their party in favor of their party. And the influence gap is therefore then just the uh, difference in assortments of the average red node and the average blue node. So you can think about it as taking the means over the reds minus the means over the blue. Um, and in order to have a working model of communities, we also propose um, this, the homophilic relaxed caveman or HRC gra graphs, in which basically you start off with a, a set of L isolated cliques, each of uh, size K, we then rewire edges um, with some as a function of a base probability P0 to rewire and this homophily factor H, which is uh, in essence, you know, how likely am I to make friends with someone of the same party? Um, and what we find is that in our HRC graphs with equal representation, um, communities seem to suppress this uh, correlation. So here is the person correlation coefficient, which is very small. And this is directly in contrast to um, what Stewart and co-authors found, which is a very strong positive correlation. Now, um, we find actually that this is somewhat due to the fact that we have quite a limited notion of correlation um, because we only considered cases of equal representation. So there's as many reds as there are blue nodes initially at the start of the game. Um, but once you start considering cases when say red has you know, a majority of five, or majority of three and put them all together, we find that the correlation is, is restored and is very strong. But in doing so, we find that a better metric, um, namely the initial red majority, um, does better. So it's a bet, just counting the number of red nodes is a better predictor of the final outcome than this slightly, um, slightly complicated influence gap, um, as you can tell by the higher PCC, the Pearson correlation. And so um, that was that we found that for a particular set of parameter values for our HRC graphs. And so we wish to ask then what happens as we change these parameters. So as we change the um, probability to rewire here, um, what we find is that um, as P increases, then the effects of homophily first is much more pronounced. Um, and while there is always a case when majority here in purple 
um, does better than the inference gap here in green, um, there actually arises a regime, something about here, in which the inference gap does do better than the majority. Uh, and just as a reference point, um, these are other metrics that we considered. Um, yeah, so looking at into the future then, we want to ask ourselves, okay, why does homophily uh, improve or reduce the predictions of a metric in, in this way? And um, is there a better metric or, you know, here we've seen that inference gap and majority are sometimes better than another and sometimes worse. So is there something that always does better? Um, what happens um, when you add bots or zealots? So these are agents that, um, that never update their uh, voting preferences. And then also to compare against historical elections, perhaps to, in order to characterize real world gerrymandering. Um, and so at that, thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Are there any questions? While we're waiting for the questions, can you maybe already say a couple of words about the other metrics that you've been thinking about? Or? Yeah, so um, we've already considered um, the efficiency gap. So um, it was like a red line, which is a, a typical political science uh, metric. It normally talks about how um, parties have how many how many wasted votes do parties have, mm. uh, and then the difference in that is basically you know that tells you how gerrymandered uh, an election or a districting is. <coughs> um, but what we find that that does worse entirely than every than the other two. We've tried um, making like a so the actual voting game itself is informed by some social experiments that they ran, um, so it's very probabilistic. Uh, so, and so we uh, made like a deterministic, deterministic version, run that one step ahead and use that as a metric. Um, that does a bit better than the efficiency gap, but still worse than the other two. So currently we've not really found anything that, that's even on the same level, really. Okay. Are there any questions from anyone or are you exhausted? All right, then maybe not today. So then thank you very much once more. Thank you very much again to all the speakers. Uh, somebody can maybe uh, post the link to the paper into the chat uh, in the next few seconds before we're closing down. So Judy can still find it. Um, it's at the, sorry, it's at, it was published um, at the Net Reason workshop at ECI 2020. Um, just just so, so you know, it's, it's there and we're going to, try and publish in Amos soon. Um, You're yeah. not supposed to say that before you submit it, but all right, never Sorry. mind. It's also a special issue for the net reason I hear that um, you might find about very reason, recently you, where you can submit it, just saying. Okay, um, thank you very much everyone. Uh, it has been a pleasure. I'm always amazed how we managed to finish these things on time and, and, and we did. Um, Next week, we're going to have a, a standard session again with just two speakers, but they get a little bit more time. It's going to be uh, Lee Derry and uh, Toby Walsh. So that should be something to look forward to for everyone. And I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.